on the boats and they won't leave. Uh, and so the women and the kids get all the weapons and get them to the factory. And so now, now the striking workers have guns. And so if you're Henry Clay Frick, this has, this has snowballed dramatically in a very bad way. So Frick goes to the governors of several nearby states, Ohio, New York. Uh, he gets multiple National Guard contingents from other states to come. Uh, and they eventually lay siege to the factory. And as you might imagine, there was an ugly, sort of vicious fight. Then until a lot of people killed and a lot of people injured. Uh, and so when the smoke clears, Frick is in control, uh, but uh, Homestead is, is sort of like this new peak of the level of violence this labor movement appears to, to cause, right? Uh, and so uh, there's some interesting sort of side notes that you can mention here. Uh, Carnegie's reputation never recovers. He, he's fond of going back to his hometown in Scotland and donating things to them. He goes back all the time. Uh, and he built a health spa because uh, there's like the hot springs in the mountains, so he built a health spa so that people from the town can go up there and it's like business for the town. In a hotel and things. He built them like a school and a library. And so this all happens. He, the homestead thing was beginning, but he gets on a boat and goes across the Atlantic Ocean, and the telegraph wires bring the news of the gunfight at Homestead before Carnegie gets off the train. So when he gets off the train, there's just that little parade for him. It's like, oh, Andrew Carnegie, you know, famous hometown son, you know, great guy. And when he gets off the train, there's like, it's angry, there's very tense, there's people booing and like throwing paper at him. And when he finally sort of pigeonholes somebody and is like, hey, what's actually going on? And they're like, do you not read the newspaper? Like, you, you know, you murdered a bunch of people in Pennsylvania. Like, you shot a bunch of workers, right? Like, guys like us, right? And Carnegie's sort of like, well, I didn't really, I didn't, you know, order it or whatever. Uh, but for the rest of his life, he sort of gets it sort of associated with this kind of very violent, very ugly incident that happened in Pennsylvania, right? And so uh, Henry Clay Frick, by the way, uh, does not have a particularly great time either after Homestead. Within the next several months, his daughter dies. She uh, was about, I want to say, like five or six, and she accidentally swallowed a hat pin, uh, like a bobbin pin from a hat band, and it perforated her trachea and she died. Uh, and so today, this would be the kind of thing where an x-ray would have saved her life. They would have just gone in and got it, but th it was really not a thing that they did very much in those days. The x-ray machine had been invented uh, by Edison in the 1870s, and he'd used it to try to save Grover Cleveland in 1881 when Cleveland had been shot. He convinced the doctors to let him x-ray the president, and to prove that it worked, he shot a cow, x-rayed the cow, and took the bullet out of the cow. Wow. And so they, uh, they, they convinced him to do it, but they wouldn't let him move the president off of the president's bed. Uh, and so when uh, Edison and x-rayed Grover Cleveland, it didn't work. He couldn't yeah. figure out how. It was because the president was on a metal bed frame, and the metal bed frame messed up the x-rays. Uh, and so when Cleveland died, like, 60 days after being shot, uh, and when they uh, opened him up after his autopsy, his entire thoracic cavity was full of pus from an infection caused by the doctors going in with dirty hands looking for wow. looking for where the bullet was. And they were looking in the wrong part of his body for where the bullet had gone in when he got shot. Uh, and so medical technology, even in the 1890s, was, was in some respects shockingly primitive. It had only been a few years uh, before Edison and Grover Cleveland, that Dr. Joseph Lister tried to convince English doctors that they had to wash their hands, right? That you had to wash your hands before you touched patients, uh, or after you touched patients. He had, uh, Lister had been drummed out of the British medical field for suggesting that doctors might spread diseases with dirty hands. After all, doctors are gentlemen, and gentlemen don't have dirty hands. That's just extremely rude to suggest. And so Lister took over a maternity hospital uh, and made all of the doctors wash their hands in carbolic acid, which is not good for your skin. But he reduced uh, post-maternity and pre-maternity deaths in the ward by like 97%, which you'd think would be good enough, but it wasn't. Uh, and so uh, that was that was that was out, right? And so things that were basic to the medical profession today, like wash your hands, clean your equipment, uh, it sort of just hadn't quite come around again. It would be the 20th century. Uh, and so Frick had this horrible personal tragedy, and just as he's getting over it, uh, or you know, you never really get over it, but I guess getting himself back together again. Uh, he's the subject of an assassination attempt. Uh, two anarchists, uh, Alexander Berkman, a Russian immigrant, and Emma Goldman, an American anarchist, decide to assassinate Frick, principally in response for Homestead. It's, it, there's a whole bunch of things they don't like about Frick. He's not an exactly likable guy if you're a worker, but they sort of that's like the thing that he did that's bad, right? So they buy Berkman a suit uh, and a gun. Uh, and Bergman calls and makes an appointment with Frick. He just calls on the phone and says, hi, I am a lawyer, you know, John Smith. I want to talk to Henry Clay Frick. And he says, sure, come in Tuesday at 2 o'clock. You know, no big deal. Uh, it's just, you know, really, they assume he wouldn't be calling unless there's a reason. So Bergman goes into the office 
and they say, oh, you know, Mr. Smith or whatever, yeah, just have a seat, he's in a meeting, he'll, he'll come out and get you in a second, it's no big deal. So, okay, fine, right? So Burke is just getting nervous. I mean, what if they're gonna call the cops, what if they're on him? He keeps sort of asking, like, oh, yeah, the meeting is late, it's no big deal, right? Apparently they had no idea who Bergman was, and it was all just, you know, it was on the phone or whatever. And so, uh, agitated by all this, Bergman is worried he's gonna be found out, so he jumps up, runs past the secretary's desk, pushes open the door, pulls out the gun, and he shoots Henry Clay Frick in the chest twice does not kill him, severely injures him, so he drops the gun, pulls on a railroad tie, and tries to bash in Frick's head. Uh, and they wrestle the railroad tie away from him, and they exit, and they sort of arrest Bergman and, and detain him, whatever. Uh, and so he gets executed uh, for attempted murder, uh, and uh, Emma Goldman herself uh, escapes any, any uh, connection with it. Uh, but after World War I, she will be exiled to Russia and have her citizenship stripped. Uh, the uh, attorney general at the time is a guy named E. Mitchell Palmer, and in response to a whole bunch of uh, anarchist bombings, of, including his house, uh, by uh, mail bombs, by the packages that have been put in the mail and, and sent to people. Uh, what he does, he puts together this big sweep of all the, the radical anarchist organizations in the country, socialists and anarchists, and has them all rounded up and tossed in jail. Uh, and so uh, as a result, uh, Goldman gets caught. Uh, and they, they revoke her citizenship, which is not strictly speaking legal, uh, and they put her on a, a boat to Russia. And this is after the Russian Revolution. So the argument is, you know, if you're a filthy, stinking commie, I guess you should put you on a boat to Russia, and you'll like it there. And of course it's not. The, the Russians don't want a boat full of American radicals in Russia. They don't know what, <laughs> what the purpose of this is. Uh, and as you might imagine, Emma Goldman's an American citizen. You can just throw her out of the country. Uh, but the guy who puts it all together uh, is a guy who's established what he views as a sort of security service for the American federal government, a sort of a, a, a sort of a domestic spy agency for the American government uh, called the Bureau of Investigations, which will later be called the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. Uh, and the guy who heads it, uh, the first head of the FBI is J. Edgar Hoover. And Hoover is the guy that puts together uh, the deportations of all these radicals after World War One. Uh, and so uh, Hoover says something snotty to Emma Goldman, like, guess you'll like it over in Russia, uh, or whatever, and she says something cr like particularly nasty back to him, like, you know, uh, you, you, the only person as stupid as you would try to deport an American citizen, uh, or something like that. And so uh, Hoover, uh, you may or may not know, served as the head of the FBI uh, from its inception in the 20s, just after this, all the way up until the mid-1970s. Uh, when he died in office as the head of uh, the FBI. When he died, uh, he, uh, there's a, we have the audio tapes. Uh, President Richard Nixon got a phone call that uh, Hoover had died in his home and died in his sleep because he was a pretty elderly guy. Uh, and uh, Nixon called his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, and he said to Haldeman, uh, you go to Herbert Hoover's house and you get, you get his fucking files. Uh, because the rumor was that Hoover had blackmail material on everyone in Washington. Uh, when they got there uh, in the basement of Hoover's house, Helen Gandy, Hoover's personal secretary, was burning all of his files. Uh, so she said it was just routine, you know, just get rid of But we will never know what was in them because she never spoke a word, right? Uh, but allegedly, Hoover had black military all on literally everybody in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Did Hoover survive the assassination attempt? Yeah, for did, yeah. He, they, 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 uh, he recovered, which is amazing for a guy who got whacked in the head with a railroad pin and shot twice. Uh, but as it turned out, he did. Uh, and so, uh, well, we might mention uh, J. Edgar Hoover a little bit more uh, later, but that's how he got his start, was fighting the radicals and the labor movement. And again, he was, he was head of the FBI until the 1970s. Okay. So, uh, having said that, uh, what can we say uh, about this? Well, in case it wasn't sort of grim enough, we have yet another uh, bad strike, and that strike takes place in Pullman. Uh, Pullman is a little town in Illinois. Uh, it's uh, west of Chicago. Uh, and so uh, Pullman is, is the, the guy that runs the town is named George Pullman. Uh, and Pullman, uh, he had a company, and the company made uh, railroad cars, right? And the, the trick about all this is that the Pullman car became a brand name the way that like Kleenex or like, Windex uh, or Coca-Cola is a brand name for things like tissue, glass cleaner, and soda. Uh, the Pullman car were what they call sleeper cars. They were the kind of railroad car where you don't get uh, a chair that, like a, that you sit in. Rather, it's like a, uh, you get a little cabin that turns into a bed, right? It's like a chair and a table, and they fold it up and fold down a bed, right? Uh, in, uh, in America, railroad cars are always very egalitarian. They look like buses, it's just rows of seats, right? Uh, the good news is that's because we're good American, Republican, you know, Democratic people, and we like to all sit together. The Europeans find that shocking 
you're just getting in a car with a bunch of weirdos and sit there and stare at them and like pretend to care. And so uh, European railroad cars have cabins where you get like the, the Hogwarts Express and Harry Potter where you open the door and there's like two rows of seats. So you sit with your friends and talk to people and it's like civilized or whatever. Uh, we're like, yeah, but you can fit fewer seats in. So like, why don't you cram more people in, right? Uh, and so the Europeans have their own hysterics about railroad cars because my God, what if what if a woman were to go into a railroad car and then like she would be there with a man like, uh, and originally, the railroad cars in Europe opened from the outside. So when you, the, you know, they, all the cabins would be completely separate. You couldn't really go from cabin to cabin. Uh, the conductors would unlock them and let you in and lock them and then unlock them at the station. And so there are all these sorts of wonderful stories about people disappearing from locked railroad cabins or getting murdered and whatever. Uh, and so in America, uh, we did we did the more egalitarian thing and have we have just you know, sort of public transportation kind of railroads. And so uh, the problem is though, as the railroad network gets bigger. Railroad trips can take a long time, right? I mean, you get on a railroad in New York City at eight in the morning, you're not getting off until at least nighttime in Chicago, right? If not longer. Uh, and so, hence the Pullman car, right? And so Pullman specialized in very upmarket sleeper cars, right? They had a, a restaurant car, a dining car attached to them. The cabins were, were pretty large for a railroad cabin. Uh, they had their attendants called porters, who were typically African American men dressed in a very smart uniform, it was like a, a nice red velour jacket. Uh, it was a very good job uh, for, for African American men, very high paying job for African American, very high status. Uh, and so the idea was if you bought a Pullman bird, the porter would like meet you because uh, he'd have a list of the people, you know, he'd come find you uh, and he would put your bags on, he would get you situated, you know, you'd go to drinks on the, on the dining car. Uh, when it was time for dinner, you know, you'd go have some drinks or some food and he would turn down the bed. And, uh, and he would sort of uh, uh, take care of everything for you, right? and you, you'd like get you anything you needed or whatever, right? Uh, and so these things are, are very good, they're very upmarket. The problem is there's not a huge uh, demand for them, right? I mean, they're expensive, you can buy them, they're durable, they last a long time. If you're a railroad and you buy a Pullman car, you're gonna wanna take care of it, right? You're gonna wanna clean it, maintain it, so you're not buying new ones, right? Well, in the 1890s, there's another depression, uh, right? Uh, 1893, is it hits, right? And so what happens uh, is that uh, all, lots of businesses close, you know, unemployment goes up, well, wages go down, so on, all the stuff that happens. Uh, and so the Pullman's business is particularly hard hit, uh, right? It's particularly hard hit because, of course, if you're the railroads, what's the first thing you do when the recession hits? Well, you cancel any orders for Pullman cars because you just, you know, not only you're not selling Pullman berths, but you're not going to, like, buy another one, right? You don't need any more. And so the problem with Pullman is this hits him in a very hard time. Uh, in the 1880s, he was thinking about how to make his company more efficient and more effective, right? Henry Ford is gonna come up with the idea uh, of sort of scientific management, right? Of organizing the workers so that they, they, they are most efficient, breaking the, the jobs down into the smallest possible components. And the, the, at the height of what they call Fordism, Ford actually had motion experts, like kinesiologists and stuff, come to the factories and literally design the workspaces so that the workers would move efficiently, right? And they had systems to move spare parts in and empty racks out of them. And all the workers hated it because there's a guy with a stopwatch and a clipboard literally watching you do your job saying, you can do that faster. Or like, Check, turn the way you're standing and it would be more efficient or whatever. Uh, and so Ford focused on the point of uh, your work, right? Uh, Pullman came up with this idea of, of sort of building this kind of little tiny corporate community out in the Great Plains where he would sort of control everything and everything would be kind of efficient and, and sort of unified, right? So he buys a bunch of land outside of Chicago, uh, builds a town named Pullman for himself. He built, this is the arcade building, this is the city hall and the corporate headquarters. And so he built his factory outside of the town. And in a sense, it's very Carnegie, very uh, vertically integrated, right? He owns the railroad station. It leads right into the term passenger terminal and also to the freight terminal. The factory's like right there, so you can unload stuff super efficiently right into the factory and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but also, he decides to build everything in the town. He builds a theater, he builds schools, he builds a hospital, he builds houses, he builds you know, dormitories and apartment buildings and single family homes. And the idea is that if you go to work for Pullman, uh, you get a job in, in the factory in Pullman, uh, you, sort of get everything that you need, right? I mean, like you, you know, like he'll rent you a house and he has a grocery store that he gives you a line of credit uh, and uh, you, your kid goes to school in the local school uh, and you don't pay for any of those things. They sort of get, they come out of your paycheck, right? At the end of the two weeks or whatever, you get your paycheck and it has little deductions for like, here's the taxes and here's the school fees and here's the grocery credit, you know, and we sort of just dock your pay. Uh, and it's all one nice little organized community. And of course, on the one hand, it seems nice and convenient, but it's also a little creepy, right? I mean, like, you get what, like the theater, does they put on plays? Sure, but of course he, he approves what the plays are, right? And what kind of books are in the library? Well, I mean, probably not any Karl Marx, right? 
Uh, and so he's very restrict about that sort of stuff as well. But he has this idea of creating this sort of harmonious community where everybody works in the factory or is sort of connected to the workers in some way, right? Uh, and so when the recession hits in the 1890s, uh, he's not able to continue to employ all these people. And so he starts firing workers. He starts laying them off. That's just a problem. When you get laid off in Pullman, what else happens to you? You toss out of your house, right? Kid can't go to school because you're not employed in the factory anymore. Uh, we're going to meet you out of your house by you know, 5 p.m. or whatever. Uh, and so these desperate, desperate Pullman workers in the middle of the winter in 1895 go to Chicago. Uh, and they go to Eugene Debs, who is organizing the American